The following conversation is with strength coach and competitive powerlifter Daniel DeBrock. Daniel DeBrock, he has been in the industry for nearly 10 years. He has wrote for many renowned publications, some of you may have heard of, including T Nation, Elite FTS, Kabuki Strength. Um, he's based out of uh, Calgary in Canada. And we have a really great conversation on the practical, theoretical, scientific uh, underpinnings of nutrition, food, uh, behavior change, um, and how we and everybody can interact with food and build skills around their nutrition to achieve any and all outcomes that they're wanting to achieve within their body and minds. Um, so it's a very grounded conversation. I re I found out about Daniel through uh, some of his articles. He wrote through Elite FTS. Um, and one of them I do mention is called Preventing Weight Gain weight regain after a diet. He wrote a great article on muscle hypertrophy. Those are some of the ones we reference in this in this conversation, which I highly recommend uh, you take a look at. They are some of the most succinct, practical, theoretical articles that speak to everybody. He's really good at distilling the complex to simple in lay terms um, for everybody to understand and implement into their life. Uh, we also talk about Daniel's long-term objectives to squat a thousand pounds, bench 600 pounds, deadlift 900 pounds um, and, and how he came about those and what he's doing to accomplish those and how he thinks about accomplishing long-term big objective goals. And then we finish the conversation with uh, on a much more personal note about his vision for working with uh, underprivileged um, communities, low-income youths and some of his inspirations and around formulating why that is important to him. And so if you care about nutrition, if you care about behavior change, if you care about psychology, then you should really enjoy this conversation with Daniel DeBrock. I got to give you props again in person because I really think those articles you wrote for Elite FTS, <clears throat> like it wasn't just the theoretical foundational knowledge that you did it's like you did such a great job at delivering it to such a high level to speak to professionals, but also in this manner that was layman's. Like you were able to distill such high level information in a really practical way through those articles, um, which I'll reference in the beginning for the introduction for people. But how did you learn to be such a efficient communicator because i think we can get so bogged down in the theory of things that we often kind of miss how to keep go to from complex to simple yeah well first off uh thanks for having me on the podcast in the first place and uh, as well as you know uh, saying that about my article so i appreciate that um honestly i, I think communication's just kind of been a strength of mine for quite a long time uh, and so I think that kind of comes up in my writing. One of the biggest issues that I see uh, and, and one of the gaps that I kind of tried to fill with a lot of my content um, is developing more long form type content, yeah. uh, which is not as popular, doesn't get as much traction, but they tend, to, they tend to stand the test of time quite a little bit better than, than some of those shorter articles because they're so nuanced, they're so in-depth. Um, and then it's kind of like a one and done situation, right? Where I can refer my athletes or other people who have questions for me, I can just say, hey, you know what? Go check out this article. This is going to provide all the background, all the context, and then specific actionable steps that you can take. And so a lot of the times I found when I was reading articles, you know, kind of coming up in, in the past, it would either be, you know, what to do. So do this, but they wouldn't necessarily give a whole lot of like theoretical background as to why you're doing this and why it works. And then on the other hand, it would be something along the lines of, you know, here's the theoretical stuff. Here's the different mechanisms that are involved when you do, you know, uh, training at higher loads. But then there wasn't a whole lot of integrating both of those two. And so that's one of the things that I try and do as well is um, just try and make sure I'm explaining, you know, the nuance, the context and giving some background information for why you should be doing this stuff in the first place, mm. because 
I mean, if someone just tells you, hey, this is what you should be doing, it's like, okay, well, why? Mm-hmm. Right? So you need to understand why. And if you understand why, then you can implement it more effectively. And then you can also pivot when it's appropriate. And, and so I think that takes a little bit of a deeper understanding of, of some of the finer points of, of the research, but then it also needs to be tied into practical application. And that's where I think a lot of people really struggle, uh, especially when it comes to dieting. You know, I mean, if you were to talk to most people, most people know how to lose weight. They're like, I know that I need to eat less. I know that I probably need to exercise more. I know I probably need to improve the the food quality that I'm eating. So generally speaking, most people have a decent enough understanding from a conceptual level, but then where things really break down is, is an execution, right? And so bridging that gap is, I think, uh, I think a very important um, uh, task. And I think it's something that, you know, a lot of coaches kind of struggle with and, and including myself, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult process, but sorry, I hope that kind of answers your questions. I know. No, that no, it does. Time. I want to dig into that. Um, but before uh, we go on, I think your mic is actually rubbing against, just a heads up, um, oh. against your jacket. Um, and that's actually what I want to dig into. Um, everybody, like, there's unlimited information, right? Everybody kind of knows what to do intuitively. Yeah, that's better. Um, what do you think the biggest barriers are for people in regards to behavior change, to getting to behavior change, to do the healthy lifestyle habit or the healthy action and establish the routine, the system, the behavior that they know is important. What do you think the main barriers are and how people can overcome them? Yeah, so that's a really complicated question. Um, <clears throat> that, that's a whole, you know, another 20, you know, 10,000 word article, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, when it comes to behavior, there's a lot of points. So I'll, I'll just kind of, um, I guess, do it point by point, I guess. So the first thing is to understand habituation, right? So most of our behavior is habituated. And, and it's actually quite critical that our behavior is habituated because if it wasn't, we literally wouldn't even be able to tie our shoes in the morning, right? So if everything that we did was required our, our resources and our conscious energy, we wouldn't be able to get anything done. So what happens is the sort of pattern recognition that your brain has and that's hardwired for. So when you do an action and you repeat that action for a long enough period of time, it becomes automated and, and that's habituation, right? And uh, when you habituate a certain behavior, it's very, very helpful because it allows us to just kind of live our lives. But then when you're trying to change a negative habit, it's very, very difficult because these things are so deeply entrenched in, uh, well, just in you, right? So I think it's really important to understand what habits are and how they function um, because then you can attack the problem a little bit more effectively. So once we understand that most of our behavior is automated, it's really important that it's, much more difficult to eliminate a habit than it is to change a habit. And this is something that I think is really commonly disregarded. A lot of the times you'll hear people doing like a sober, sober November, or I, I'm just pulling out a month. I don't know what it is, but I've sober heard people October. Say, that's, that's what sober October. popularized. Yeah. And like no sugar, December. I, I don't fucking know. I, am I allowed to swear on here? Yeah, of course. Be you, man. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so people, people will do these things where they eliminate, um, you know, food groups and it's like, okay, I mean, I understand the intention behind it, you know, discipline and all these other things. But when you look at the success rate, it's very low, right? So the success rate of dieting is, is very, very low. I think it's got a between 85 to 95% rate of recidivism, right? And it's not just an 85 to 95% rate of recidivism back to the initial weight. In a lot of cases, the individuals actually regain even more weight than when they started. And one of the reasons for that is not because they can't lose weight. Most people actually are successful at losing weight. And in the literature that that's quantified by uh, losing 10% of your body weight and keeping it off for a certain period of time. But then after, you know, when you look at that on an expanded time scale of two years, three years, four years, five years, between 85 and 95% regain at least as much weight or gain more weight than when they had started. And that's where these stats come from that you often hear. So most people can do these things where they cut out foods 
and where they can just eliminate habits or try to eliminate habits. But you can only really do that for so long for most people. And this is, again, a really complicated question because it has to do with your environment. It has to do with your, um, literally your nervous system. It has to do with, uh, you know, biochemical signaling. It has to do with uh, culture and, and just all sorts of things that kind of intertwine and impact behavior. So the first thing is not trying to eliminate habits, but trying to replace them, I think is really important. And so there's something called um, reward signaling, which is essentially you eat a food and you get this pleasurable reward, which is like a, a really complicated cascade of, of, you know, biochemical responses in your body. So you get this spike in, in dopamine and, and different hormones that make you feel good, right? And so we often get that when we um, eat high calorie, high, highly palatable foods. And so if you have a habit of eating these types of foods, like let's just say chips, it's late at night, you're, cons you're used to eating chips all the time, you get this reward from eating the chips. You get a craving and you have like some sort of trigger which incites a specific behavior, which is the habit. And then that habit once carried out has a reward, generally speaking. Now, when you're trying to change habits, again, it's very difficult to eliminate habits. So you want to think about replacing the habit because one of the interesting things about reward signaling is a lot of the times, once you've done that habit for a long enough period of time, let's stick with the, the eating a bag of chips uh, example. Initially, the reward comes from eating chips specifically. It's the rewarding sensation that you get from consuming highly palatable, calorically dense foods, right? But over time, once it becomes habituated, the reward actually stops coming from, or in many cases, stops coming from the food and actually shifts to the action. So it's the action of eating that brings the reward about. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I th what I'm hearing is you're referring to this. Have you read Atomic Habits by any yes. chance? Right, so this cue craving reward system exactly. that you sound like you're referring to. But you, you, you mentioned it changes. Yes, so the reward can change from the specific thing that you're doing just to the action, right? Which is why it's, it's so much easier to change a habit than eliminate it. So instead of thinking about, I need to stop eating late at night, think I need to sh change what I'm eating at late at night, mm. right? So a really effective solution might be, you know, opting for carrots or something like that because they're still crunchy, there's still a little bit of a texture. But again, it's just the, the cue, you have the, the trigger, which incites a specific behavior, like you were saying, and then you have the, the response, right? And so you eat the carrot, that ends up triggering that reward cascade that we're talking about, right, in, in many instances. And so that's one of the reasons why it's a lot easier to change a habit than just eliminate it altogether. Um, so that's a big part of it. And then that even goes into your environment, right? So how is your environment actually set up? You know, most people typically do pretty well Monday through Friday in their diet and where they really struggle is on the weekend. And so it's like, okay, well, why do you struggle on the weekend? And a lot of the times it's because, you know, on the weekend, they're not at work. They're not busy. So they might have, um, you know, they might succumb to boredom meeting. They might be going out with their friends. If, if their social circle tends to go out and drink or, you know, eat a lot of wings or pizza or whatever, you know, and just have that as part of their social interaction, that can be a really strong component of an individual's identity. So your social support and your social identity is really intrinsically tied into your behavior. So when you're talking about trying to change someone's behavior, especially when it's, you know, like at a wedding and you're like, hey, don't eat cake at a wedding. You know, if you're really disciplined, you do that. It's like, Yes, that's true, but these things take a lot of time to change as well. It's not a matter of don't eat this, eat this, right? It's far more complex. It's kind of the same as saying, um, you know, your goal is to squat 700 pounds and you can only squat 300. So just get under a 700 pound bar and try and squat it until you can. It's like, it's, it's just not going to work, right? And I mean, the data is pretty clear on it. We're, we're not doing a very good job as coaches communicating with our clients and saying, hey, we need to develop an iterative approach to meet people where they are to help them understand how environmental factors uh, influence their behavior. Again, if you're really stressed out at work, that stress is going to impact your, your ability to make good decisions, right? So the environment that we're in plays a very significant role. Our habits 
uh, regarding food plays a very significant role. Our um, you know, history with dieting. Do we have a history of disordered eating? Um, are we chronic dieters? Do we have uh, you know, the type of mindset that's a little bit more closely associated with dichotomous thinking? All of these things really influence an individual's perception of their diet, an individual's perception of themselves, their self-esteem, and all of these things are intrinsically linked into dieting. So it's, it ends up being a lot more complicated when you really get into it. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the, the majority of, of what you were asking. Yeah, no, that's great. And it, it's a lot of things and to dig into. I think environment, like that's a huge one for so many people. What do you think when you're working with your clients, when you're working with yourself and you look around in the, the world around you, like... How do you think people can design a better environment so they're running downhill instead of climbing uphill? Yeah, that's it's a good question. Um, I think the first thing is you need to be real with yourself about your goals and what you're actually willing to, to sacrifice. Because I think a lot of people will set goals but don't necessarily have an accurate understanding of what's required of them if they want to reach those goals. Mm. And so if you don't, and then you set out to, to reach these targets and you realize, hey, this is way harder than I thought and I'm going to have to do this for the rest of my life. It might not be a trade-off you're willing to make. Mm. So I think right from the start, it's really important if you, know, if you are a coach and you're having this conversation with, with a client or even if you're just having this conversation with yourself, that you really, really get honest about evaluating their goals, being clear about what it's actually going to take, how difficult it's going to be, the trade-offs they're going to have to make, and just explaining that to them and being like, hey, do you really understand what you're getting into? And if they do, then you can start moving forward. And if they don't, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, wow, this is a much bigger undertaking than I thought, then you need to have a follow-up conversation of, okay, well, what does that mean for your goals? Like, what are you willing to do? You know, And that's an ongoing conversation as well, because as people get better, their goals might shift or they might just find more passion and get more dedicated and double down on it. So, so it really depends, but it's, it's got to start there, I think. And people have to un understand like the difficulty of what it is they're actually getting themselves into. You know, it's, it's great for people to be like, Oh, I want to be a world champion. But it's like, you have no fucking concept of what that means. You have no idea right. how hard that is and how rare you have to be as an individual to achieve a goal like that. And, and it's the same thing when people want to look like Simeon Panda. You know, it's, it's like this guy's got one of the best physiques in the world. And you're just like, you want to look like him? Really? Do you know what it's going to take? Right. So I think right up front, that has to be addressed. Um, the next thing is kind of explaining this to them as, as it is an iterative approach. They need to understand that it's not an on-off switch. It's not a before you weren't dieting and now you're dieting and you have to be perfect. It, it's, it's very much like, okay where are you right now in your diet? What does your environment look like? What are the cues that set you off and make you eat a box of cookies at night? You know, really understanding individual's history and making them understand their history as well. Because a lot of the times there's a huge lack of clarity. And, and the research is pretty clear on this. Um, there was a paper, oh gosh, I just, I literally just pulled it up yesterday for a presentation that I was doing. Um, but it's something like there, there's up to an 80% inaccuracy in reporting in obese individuals or overweight individuals, right? When, when they're talking about tracking their food. So up to an 80% level of inaccuracy is, is pretty damn substantial. Now, I don't think that that's limited to overweight or obese populations. Just with real world experience, it's pretty clear and apparent that, um, you know, even if you are relatively healthy, relatively fit at a, at a healthy body weight, there's still a high level of inaccuracy. If were these you're not, people, I'm sorry to interrupt, were these people doing food recalls or weighing and measuring their food in like an app? Food recalls, oh, yeah. uh, food recalls. But then in addition to that, even when you are tracking with an app, um, there's still a high level of inaccuracy because they're like, uh, this is close enough or yeah. they're like not necessarily tracking the sauces that they're using and just little things like that things. that really add up over time. And this is very common, right? Like sometimes I'll get clients who will tell me they're only eating like 1,200 calories. Yeah. And I'm just like, like, you're not eating 1200 calories. You're not, you're just gaining not. weight, right? Or yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's like, I know that I know these individuals and then all of a sudden, once they actually start tracking more accurately, all of a sudden their calories go up from 1200 to like 2800. It's like, okay, that's a more accurate evaluation of where you're probably actually at. And, and that takes time, right? So understanding where people like where they're at 
um, understanding what their habits are, understanding all of the stuff that's actually going on right now and really just facing that is the first step. And I think it's very important um, because then you can start making a plan, right? If you don't factor in the individual and what they're currently doing into your intervention design, I think that's a big mistake because you're just arbitrarily setting up rules that have no real basis in what's actually going on in their lives right now. So again, like let's, let's take an optimal nutritional intervention, mm. right? And let's try and give that to uh, a professional athlete who literally is paid to eat, sleep and train. And then let's give that same, you know, optimal program to a single parent who going to school and works full time as well with a, ch with a child. It's like, they're not going to have the same level of adherence. They're going to have much different challenges and obstacles. And so you need to treat them accordingly. So understanding someone's history and then understanding the current obstacles that they have in their life and then developing a program that works around it is very important. And what that looks like is trying to pick the biggest, most impactful things that are simultaneously going to have the least influence on their life or the least change on their lifestyle. Right. So what are those things? I feel like that is a thing to dig into. Like what are the biggest bang for buck behavior changes that are the easiest to adhere to, um, least stressful, but have the biggest influence that you found? Yeah. So again, that's difficult because it's so individual, right? Everyone's going to have different problems The from a nutritional standpoint, the biggest bang for your buck things are going to be calories and, and macronutrients right? Calories, macronutrients, and uh, exercise and weighing yourself on a regular basis. Those things are going to be the most important things you can do, um, hands down. But again, that's not necessarily appropriate for everyone, right? But that's why I'm saying you need to kind of find that starting point with people. So one of the starting points that I usually do with, with my athletes, um, even if they're brand new, I'll say, I want you to track your food on my fitness pal, track every single meal. And we're going to do this for a couple months so that you can understand what you're actually consuming how what you're consuming affects your weight. You can learn the energy density of food. You can learn the different macronutrient compositions of different foods, and you can see how that's going to impact your performance. And it's kind of like lifting the veil off your eyes, right? Where, you know, most people think they eat relatively healthy, but then you kind of see what they're actually eating. You're like, oh, wow. Like I didn't realize that, you know, I'm just kind of like snacking throughout the day, but all of that adds up to an additional 700 calories. Like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty surprising. And so once you're able to recognize those things, it makes things a lot easier. So um, the research is pretty clear that when you look at individuals who are successful at both losing weight and maintaining their weight for long periods of time, which would be quantified again as over five years in many cases, sometimes it's over two years, but even still, that would be successful weight maintenance of, of losing uh, you know, more than 10% of your body weight. They all have a couple of things in common. The first thing is they are consistently they're, they're consistent with physical activity. So they have some form of exercise they're partaking in on a regular basis. They do frequent weigh-ins, right? So they're frequently weighing in, whether it's once every day, once every couple of days, frequent weigh-ins. Okay, that allows them to, again, identify where they're at and make sure they're not creeping up too much. The last thing is they have a flexible type of control in their diet, right? Um, so it allows them a little bit of flexibility, but they still have some sort of structure to kind of keep them on course. So those are the three big things, but how those can play out from individual to individual is going to vary so much. Um, I think one really easy thing that you can do that I talked about, I think in one of my articles is, um, I'll just get an athlete to, uh, have one serving of protein with every single meal. Yeah. And then I'll get them to consume a combined serving, a combined, uh, eight combined servings, sorry, I forgot how to talk, eight combined servings of fruits and vegetables per day, right? And, and, that, and that's all I do. I don't tell them don't eat any junk food. I say eat whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. Just do these two things, right? And the reason why I do that is because one, protein is very satiating and a lot of people are um, not consuming enough protein, especially as athletes. So that's going to check a couple different boxes. It's going to check the satiety box. And it's also going to make sure that performance is going to, you know, come a little bit closer to being optimized. The second thing is making sure they're getting eight servings of fruits and veggies combined. That's not eight each. That's eight total. The reason for that is because one, they're packed full of nutrients. Um, fruits are freaking delicious. And I, I really like vegetables. Some people might hate it, but whatever. But at the end of the day, they're also super satiating because they're very high in fiber. 
So if you try eating eight servings of fruits and veggies, as well as a serving of protein at every single meal, you're going to be pretty damn full. And so what ends up happening, and this is something that's quite consistent, not just with myself, but most coaches have noticed something very similar, is where people just start to unconsciously eliminate a lot of these bad foods, you know, quote unquote, bad foods, or the foods that aren't necessarily supporting their goals, just because they're like, fuck, I'm full. Yeah. Like I just, I just had like two huge salads and like a big steak, like I'm, I'm done, I'm not hungry. You know, so you're much less likely to overeat on pasta or I, I don't know, like chocolates or whatever the heck it is that you really enjoy eating because you're already full. So it ends up being one of those things that indirectly promotes good behavior or, or productive behavior relative to your goals. So that would be an example of, of something you can do that's a really big stone uh, that has a very profound or can have a very profound impact on someone's results, but it's really not all that hard, right? Um, but again, a lot of these recommendations are highly specific to the individual. That one's relatively common, which is why I think it's, it's you know, reasonable to kind of give out. Another one could just be getting their step count up, right? So maybe setting an, an arbitrary goal. So let's say, okay, I want you to track your steps for a week. Let's say they average 3,000 steps a day. Okay, I want you to average 5,000 steps a day. You know, so increasing your, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, right? Or I guess that would kind of be considered activity thermogenesis. Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, you're increasing your energy expenditure. And so that would be something that can have a very significant impact on your weight loss or weight maintenance. Uh, but there's a bunch of different things you can do. Specific recommendations require specific context, which is why I can't necessarily go into too, too much detail about those things. With you mentioned flexible meals as being one of the or flexible kind of uh, approach. Flexible um, restraint, yeah. To be one of the markers of uh, adherence long term. And that reminds me of one of the, well, I want to dig into that. Like, how do you think about, we can get very bogged down in trying to be perfect, right? You know, especially when optimal health and performance is a goal, you know, whether it's looking at, you know, I need to optimize my, my biochemistry and blood markers and my gut health and my psychology. And I'm, I want to perform to the highest level possible, or you just want to improve in certain body composition strength markers, but you feel like you need to be perfect. How do you think about integrating that flexible structure into a nutrition diet framework? One thing I read from you was this 80, 20 kind of principle. And mm -hmm. I have assimilated that into my kind of operating system. Like, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think that's part of the big answer. Um, when you're at a maintenance level, how do you think about this conversation? Yeah. So I think there's, there's quite a bit of uh, misunderstanding when it comes to what's required to reach a goal. Yeah. Right. And I guarantee this is something that every single coach has heard, right. Where they'll talk to their client and their clients like, Oh, you know what? I know I just need to cut this out or I know I just need to do this. I know I just need to do that. And they try and, you know, when you ask them what they think is required, they give you this very extreme mm. answer. They're like, I need to cut out sugar. I need to cut out gluten, whatever it might be. And it's like, okay, how have you tried doing that before? And they're like, yep. And they were like, yeah, and it actually worked. And I'm like, oh, so then you've already reached your goal. And they're like, well, no, it worked for a while, but then I gained the weight back. And I'm like, okay, so it didn't work then. And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, so why do you want to try that again if it didn't work? You know, and, and usually you kind of have to ask these questions to make them realize like, hey, what I believe is true is probably not true because most people think that you do need to be very rigid and they think that it's a lot about like willpower and, and all this stuff. And it's like, I mean, yeah, willpower obviously plays into it, but I just, it's not, it's just such a, it's such a small component of, of what's actually going on. Right. It's because people aren't necessarily approaching it from the right state of mind. Right. So uh, dichotomous thinking is, a type of thinking that is very black and white, right? So it's associated at the extremes. It's there are good foods, there are bad foods. Mm. And a lot of the times, good foods and bad foods also have a very strong, um, a strong representation on like moral integrity. So if you cave and you have bad foods that because you are morally inferior and you, uh, you know, are a weak individual and there's all this stuff that's kind of associated and tied in with these thoughts, and so 
rigid restraint is much more associated with dietary regressions and recidivism, right? So rigid restraint being, I will not eat sugar. I will not do this. I will not do that. Whereas flexible restraint is more so associated and actually promotes long-term successful weight loss as well as weight maintenance. And this is also true for performance as well. Even bodybuilders. Bodybuilders have to be extremely strict, uh, professional ones anyway, so to be extremely strict on their diet. But they only do that for a couple of months out of the year. The rest of the year, they are not dieting. Successful, successful bodybuilders do not diet year round, right? And, and this is a big thing that I think a lot of people don't really understand. So they try and take all of these things. Like you were saying, people look at gut health. People look at like they're trying to optimize the, the nutrient partitioning and mm. supplementation, all this stuff. And it's like, how about you just try sticking to your diet for 10 days in a row? Mm. Like if you can't stick to your diet for 10 days in a row, I'm not going to fucking give you a calorie cycling approach. I'm not going to give you additional supplementation. I'm not going to give you anything that is going to optimize anything because you can't even get the basics down. Right. It's like trying to trying to learn how to drive a fucking NASCAR when you can't even ride a bike. It's like, dude, you are not ready yet. You know, so a lot of the times people try and jump the gun and and it's understandable as well because, you know, learning about insulin and learning about nutrient partitioning and meal timing and muscle protein synthesis and optimizing these, you know, these little windows post and pre-workout is really exciting. It's cool. You're like, Oh, I'm doing something scientific and complex. And it's like, yeah, but scientific and complex does not mean effective, right? That's not to say these things aren't effective, but when you look at the magnitude of impact they have relative to tackling something like your energy balance, it's so minuscule. It's so fucking minuscule. And so people always want to go for the complex things first. You've got to start with the basics, master the basics, and then you've got to progress from there. So coming back to the, the flexible dieting approach, you know, you're not going to start out perfect. You're just not. You're going to do well for a little while, and then you're going to fall off. Expect that you will fall off. And don't call yourself a bad person. Don't call yourself a piece of shit. Don't be like, I fucking knew it. I'm a failure, whatever. It's like, grow up. You're an adult. You know, if your kid was doing that, you'd be like, you're crazy. So don't do that nonsense yourself, right? Well, that's good. Um, that's really good perspective reframe uh, the, of asking yourself, how would you treat yourself if you were speaking to your child or to a f good friend, right? It's yeah. like that really puts it in perspective. Yeah. And I use that with my, my athletes a lot. They're like, oh man, this is happening. I'm like, okay, what would you say if that was your boyfriend who, who did that? And that's they're true. like, Oh, well, blah, blah. And it's, it, it is a really good way of getting people out of their own head and realizing like, oh, hey, this isn't the end of the world. Or, oh, hey, maybe I'm not a bad person, whatever, right? And so, yeah, it's really important to, to understand that and then be like, okay, well, what's the next step, right? Because adherence is what's going to get you to your goals. So where are we starting, right? Not trying to start by getting everything right all at once. It literally, again, like coming back to the initial example that I gave of we might just literally start with, I want you to get a serving of protein every day and eight servings combined of fruits and veggies. Something as simple as that. You know, that's, there's nothing scientific about that. It's super fucking basic, but it's very effective. And then once people start seeing changes and they're like, oh, what's the next step? And then again, we make the next step based on their lifestyle, based on what it is that they're looking to accomplish. Because the next step for them might be, hey, you know what, I'm getting a lot of like, you know, GI irritation when I'm training. So they might actually have to look at meal timing because maybe they're eating too soon or too far away from their, their training window, right? So maybe we'll start looking at that. But again, it's highly independent. But you want to make sure that you're checking off those big boxes. You want to make sure that you understand, hey, I'm not going to come into this and be an expert. Like you don't start your first day of university and write your master's thesis in the same day. Right? You have to slowly progress and go through the ranks just like everyone else. And a lot of the times I think people regard dieting very differently. They, they think that it's just eat this or don't eat this. And everyone can eat things and everyone can not eat things. So they don't really understand that it's an actual skill. Mm -hmm. But dieting is a skill. Right, Organizing your lifestyle around nutrition or organizing your nutrition around your lifestyle, whichever you prefer, is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And so you know, if, if people were to look at it in the same way that they looked at soccer or race car driving or something like that, where it does have a high level of skill requirement, then I think they'd be a little bit more realistic with their responses, right? They'd be a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little, maybe a little softer with themselves or a little bit more, I don't know the English word, um, 
chill, I guess, about it. You know what I mean? And they'd understand that it's a progressive approach where I start with this and then I build and then I build and then I build and then I build. And that's where that 80-20 comes in because realistically, you're, you're, not, you're probably not going to see like amazing results if you're only 50% adherent. Right. But if I can quantify that and I can say, hey, based on our chart, you're only 50% adherent. This is why you're not getting results. That's actually a positive thing because it puts the power back into your hands as opposed to being like, well, I don't know what's going on. You're dieting, you know, and that's a really difficult thing to deal with actually as well, because when you start a diet, you go from doing nothing to doing a ton of work, but it's like, unless you're doing enough work, like you need to reach a critical mass. So you might be doing, let's say this much work, but you need this much work to get results. So you're like, I wasn't doing work before, my weight wasn't changing. I'm doing all this work now, my weight's not changing. What the fuck's up? But if you can actually quantify it and say, hey, you know what? I can see that this week you've only followed your diet, you know, 48% of the time or 63%. That's not the cutoff point that we agreed on. It, it, It Again, it puts the power in the individual's hands and allows them to see that, hey, my behavior is what ultimately determines my my success, not what I think about myself, not my preconceptions, not whatever. That, and I want to double back, you talked about the skill of eating and I read this in one of your articles and I'm like, yeah, like no one really talks about that. Like we take for granted that every single day, pretty much we all eat for our whole lifetime. Yet there's no operating system to which we are taught to engage with the food and nutrition for the average person. How do I consciously, deliberately, purposefully hunt, discover, appreciate, be grateful for all these varieties of foods, not feel guilty or interact with foods to a healthy level mentally and physiologically and do it consciously and not unconsciously because we just gorge ourselves every single day without thinking, especially in environments socially. How do you think people can develop that tighter relationship and more healthy relationship, more conscious relationship and skill of eating and interacting with food? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the first thing, again, is acknowledging that it is a skill. Um, So for instance, if you look at building a house, right? It's like, what's required in building a house? Okay, well, you need to be able to cut wood. You need to be able to hammer nails. You need to be able to, you know, carry a couple things and, you know, take measurements with a measuring tape and all stuff. It's like, if we ask people can you do these things individually? Yes, everyone can do those things individually. Everyone can hammer a nail. Everyone can take a measurement. Everyone can do all this stuff. But then if you say, put it all together and build me a house, most people are going to be like, uh, I have no idea what to do. Mm. And that's the same thing when it comes to dieting. It's like, yes, sure, you can weigh out a meal. But that's like such a small component of dieting. How are you going to navigate when you know you have to rush from work to training and then, you know, someone's birthday party and you haven't eaten all day and you're starving and there's a huge buffet there. Mm. What do you do? You know what I mean? And it's like, you can say, oh, I can pack meals and I can do this and that. But then it's like, okay, well, are you comfortable with eating in front of other people out of Tupperware at a fancy event? You know, like I am, I don't give a shit, but not, not everyone is. And so it's like, how do you structure your day around those things? What happens if you run out of groceries and you're too busy to go grocery shopping because work is slamming you and you have to order out? What do you do when, you, when you're in that situation? What do you do when you, know, you, you get sick and you just can't seem to keep anything down without throwing up? Like, How do you manage your diet then? What do you do you know, like when you're on vacation or if you're at, again, another event with your family? How do you set boundaries when you're um, out with your friends, especially if your friends have a very active social life, like to drink, like to, you know, go out and eat and things like that. That's, that's a really important part of, of uh, you know, our social life and, and our kind of sense of self-identity and how we connect with people is through food. So how do you manage all that? The, these are really important questions and they're difficult questions. Um, but I think the first place to start again is you have to acknowledge it's a skill. You have to start somewhere and you got to start small. Right. So much smaller than you probably think you need to. So, uh, again, coming back to what we talked about previously of of the professional athlete versus, you know, the single parent, Uh, if the professional athlete has a ton of experience, yeah, we can toss him in the deep end and he'll probably be fine. But the single parent might not be. So we have to look for those low hanging fruit that is accessible to them. So if they're always going out, let's say they go out four times a week, I might say, okay, you know what, go out four times a week, but one of those weeks or one of those days that you go out, 
I want you to order just a salad with no dressing. Just like it's, it's so simple. I'm not saying don't eat out. I'm not saying, I'm just saying don't have some dressing. You know what I mean? Now this is just, again, arbitrary off the top of my head, but starting small. And then once they do that, then it's like, okay, then let's maybe make two meals that are a little bit healthier, a little bit more calorie friendly. Okay, then let's make three meals a little bit more calorie friendly. Let's make four meals a little bit more calorie friendly. Hey, now maybe let's try and actually plan it so that you eat before you go out. And so you're not having to waste your calories in these things or your money. And you can end up saving quite a bit of money as well. So, you know, it's, it's a constant communication between the client and, and the athlete um, or just between yourself, you know, but you have to kind of create a progression and leave yourself with enough time to make sure that that is something that becomes manageable before you toss something else on. Because a lot of the times people try and stack things on too quickly. Yeah. You know, like I'll, I'll give uh, especially, and this is especially true for people who are terrible at dieting. Um, I don't know why it is. They're, they're always like, man, I'm so dedicated. I got this. Don't worry. Just give me, give me all this stuff. And then I give them one thing to do. And they're like, but I need more. Like I can do more. And I'm like, just do this. If you do this, then I'll give you more. Mm. First, show me that you can do this. And then sure enough, they come back a week later. They've only tracked three days of calories. They only weighed themselves in twice. And I'm like, okay, we're not getting anywhere until you do this. I'm not giving you anything else. And they don't like it. It pisses them off. And the reason a lot of the times why they actually want more stuff is they want to do other shit. They don't want to do the stuff that works because it's hard. It's hard and it's boring. Like tracking your food day in and day out and waiting the weeks and the months and the years that it takes to like build muscle, build a great physique. It takes a long fucking time. It's not like a Rocky montage. It's not like the harder you work, the faster your results come. It's the harder you work, the results come at the exact same fucking pace. If you're meeting the certain criteria, doing more shit isn't going to get you there faster. It's just going to entertain your mind and give you this false sense of, of progress. It just really isn't there. So once you're doing what you need to be doing, you just need to be patient. And, and the process is not exciting. And I think that's one thing that really sets people off. Um, I can't remember what your question was or if no, I no, no. Have... that's, that's <laughs> just going off these, these rants and riffs is great. Like, um, you asked really good questions in the beginning, right? You know, what do you do when this happens? What do you do when this happens? I feel like most people don't ask themselves those hard questions, not just with diet and nutrition, but with life. Like, what do you do when your mother dies? What are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do when, if you get sick, if you get an illness, okay? But let's, to give the context of nutrition, or maybe this can be even broader, how do you go about developing contingency plans to use your words I've, I've heard you use for nutrition and then zooming out life? Are there any exercises you do? Do you write self-reflection? Um, or is it just through experience of just doing it? How would you recommend people start developing backup contingency plans so they are prepared for all of those scenarios and questions you asked? Yeah. And this is really where like the rubber hits the road and you have to start turning like intention into actually into action. And so there's something called um, the intention behavior gap. So you can think of this as when people are like, oh, I'm going to start my diet on Monday, right? There is a very big gap between their intention to start on Monday and their behavior and what they're actually going to do. So your emotions are very transient. So when people tell me they don't have willpower, for instance, I'm like, oh, well, I don't really buy that. And it's not really overly that important anyways, because it's an emotion and emotions are transient. They can't be relied on there. You're, if you're at the beck and call of your emotions, you're not getting anywhere in life, right? But if you understand what the intention uh, behavior gap is, then you can say, hey, you know, if I want to make sure that I'm successful, I need to create these contingency plans. So if I'm actually going to start on Monday, okay, well, what is it going to mean? Like, what, what if I'm having a shitty day? What if I get home and I'm tired, you know? Um, so what, what are the things, what are the roadblocks that can set me off, right? So you might be like, oh, well, I come home and I'm just like really tired. And so I just try and chill for like a little bit. But then once I chill, I'm like, oh, I just don't want to go to the gym, mm-hmm. right? So you can kind of identify these bottlenecks and these, these roadblocks you run into. And then you can plan for it. 
So you can say, okay, I know that even though I'm intending to do that, I know that historically I do not choose the right behavior based on my goals when I'm actually faced with a situation in the moment. So what I can do is instead I can pack my gym bag and bring it to work and then go to the gym from my work instead of going home first, right? So that's a very clear actionable step. I've got my gym bag packed. I'm bypassing going home and sitting down and relaxing and then losing any sort of motivation to go. So that's one thing you can do. Again, meal prep is another thing you can do because if you're like, oh, fuck, I just don't want to cook any food tonight, you might order skip the dishes. And again, that's not bad. It's just you need to understand how that's going to fit into your goals, right? So if you're okay with going a little slower uh, but having an easier process, that's fine. If you want a little bit faster, you're going to have to adopt the response or accept the responsibility that comes with that. Um, so if you have your meals already prepped out, again, that closes that gap between intention and behavior where you're like, you know, oh, you know what? I just, I just won't eat sugar or I won't do this. And it's like you, you, your ability to evaluate accurately how you're going to respond when you're in a situation is just so not accurate. Like if anyone's ever been in a street fight before, everyone's always like, oh man, I'll, I'll be able to handle myself because of A, B, and C. You get in a street fight and you're like, you don't even remember what happened. You're like, what the fuck just happened? Oh my God. You know, because everything just happened so quickly. You're not used to it. You have, you know, you have no idea what's going on. It's the same thing in this sense, right? You're not going to be able to accurately predict your emotional state and your ability to uh, be consistent. That's something that comes with habit. And so removing a lot of these roadblocks, removing a lot of these bottlenecks, packing, uh, packing your bag before you go to the gym, if that's an issue, uh, doing your meal prep so that, you know, even when you're feeling lazy, you can just toss in the microwave or you can toss it in the stove. It's already done. It's already portioned out. It's already everything for you. Um, you know, if, if you go out and every time you go out, you have intentions not to drink, but you always get hammered with your friends. Okay, go out and still drink, but just drink a bunch of water or make sure you eat a bunch before you go out. So you're not wasting money on food and then also going off your diet and, and just kind of like going off the rails. So there's a lot of different things you can do to set yourself up in the future for success. And that's really important because a lot of the times people will look to the future and they'll be like, you know what, this is just what I'm going to do. And it's like, well, I doubt it, you know? So you need to have those contingency plans in place. And that all starts with awareness. So one of the things that I do as well is I get uh, uh, all my athletes to track certain metrics mm. and that level of awareness, um, you know, through tracking keeps them, keeps them on point. Do you have any favorite metrics that you think, pretty much all humans could benefit from measuring at some point. Yeah. So barring individuals who have existing psychological disorders with sure. regards to food, uh, you know, like body dysmorphia or um, anorexia, bulimia, things like that. I think generally speaking, everyone should track calories for a certain period of time, not forever, yeah. but for three months. If you track calories for three months, you will have a completely different um, understanding and appreciation for food, food quality, caloric density of foods, all sorts of stuff. So I think that's something everyone should do at least for a certain period of time. Um, after that, I actually find that it's more important to track behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much sleep are you getting every night, right? If, if every time you're, you're tired and that's when you binge, okay, we need to make sure that we're getting enough sleep so that we don't binge and we don't have to even, you know, manage that situation because a lot of times you can prevent it from coming up. So tracking sleep, um, tracking calories for a certain period of time, uh, tracking steps. If your goal for, is for weight loss, I think is very, very effective and highly underutilized. Tracking steps is one of the most effective things you can do in my opinion for weight loss. And I know that like, I'm a strength conditioning coach. I coach a lot of strength athletes and power lifters and things like that. And I was like, what are you talking about? Why don't you work in the gym? And it's like, dude, it, it's so fucking effective. What you know? do you find? Like, I totally agree in my experience. Like, I 100% agree, especially because you can multitask. You, you can habit stack while you while you walk, for example. But why do you see walking as a, a keystone habit? I think it's incredibly important because it doesn't suck. Like, if, yeah. if, I, if I get you to go into the gym and work out and you don't like working out, you're probably not going to stick with it. So usually what I'll tell people to do who don't like going to the gym, um, I don't have lots of like exclusively weight loss clients. I have a lot of athletes who I help lose a lot of weight, but it's for a performance uh, enhancement, right? But 
even still, I think it's the same, right? Like a lot of the times people don't, who just want to lose weight, they don't want to go to the gym. They don't like it, you know? And the idea that the gym is the only way you can get fit is kind of ridiculous because like, what did people do before the gyms even existed, you know? Just so I usually it. recommend, I usually recommend like picking a sport that you really enjoy. Like if it's rock climbing, go rock climbing, do something to be active. Um, and walking is a really easy way to do that. It's very low barrier. You don't need to have any level of fitness. You can do it by yourself. So it's really accessible for most people. And then, like you said, you can stack habits. So a fantastic thing that you can do is listen to an audiobook, listen to a podcast while you're going for a walk. You go for an hour walk every day or, you know, 30 minute walk twice a day. Um, when you're at work, you're standing at your desk for a certain period of time. It's like, do all these little things make a big difference? No. But then when you stack them up and then you you repeat them day in and day out, they can make a huge difference. Like I've had clients lose like 30 pounds just by doing 10,000 steps a day. I didn't change their diet at all. They just 10,000 steps a day. And they lost like 30 pounds over three months. You know, no change in their training, no change. Like, so you can have a really dramatic effect just through walking. So, um, and again, it's, it's very low barriers. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's so effective as well. Um, but yeah, and then I think monitoring your body weight is also very important because you can't lie. Like some people get really upset and they're like, oh, fuck, I hate the scale. And it's like, yeah, but the fact that you hate the scale is one of the reasons why you're struggling so much. You need to just accept it. You're overweight, you know, or, or maybe they're not overweight, but maybe they're not the weight that they want to be. And it's like, just fucking, you know, man up and just look at it and accept it. Or if you're a woman, woman up, like just accept the fact that you don't like the weight that you're currently at. And if you see that over and over and over, guess what? You're going to fucking do something about it, you know, or you're going to just give up and be like, you know what? This isn't that important to me, you know, but you're going to have to face the reality of your situation. So consistent weight monitoring, I, whether it's once a day, once every other day, I think is very important as well. And then taking the average of that. So don't worry about daily fluctuations yes. in weight that can, that can go up as much as like 10, 15 pounds from day to day depending on how big you are, uh, you know, and how much food you have in your system, how much water and, and you've retained. So daily fluctuations are normal, um, but the weekly average and then taking weekly averages and looking at the trends from week to week, that's going to be much more indicative of your actual body weight and where your weight is headed. Uh, and then on top of that, what you'll notice is that once your diet starts to become dialed in and more consistent, you're actually going to have much less fluctuation from day to day just because you're going to be eating similar foods or going to be higher quality things like that. Now, you mentioned standing on the scale, man up, woman up. And I think for many people, that's the case. They absolutely just need to get over themselves and their own preconceived notions and, and hang ups. But there is also a select minority. And I really appreciate how you talk about this because it doesn't get talked about a lot, especially with male coaches is eating disorders, body image issues, dysmorphia, bulimia, um, and they, if they do those habits, if they step on that scale, they know that is a slippery slope to heightened neuroticism and anxiety and depression. How do you regulate? I don't know if you've had much experience working with men and women, particularly women with those types of issues. How do you walk that tightrope to work with them? What, and for those listening who may have engaged with those types of unhealthy um, mental frameworks, like what do you say to them and get the tools that you give them to help them? Yeah. So I'll preface this by saying if anyone does have an actual like eating disorder um, or some sort of issue like that, I'd highly recommend seeing a qualified clinician, um, not just any, you know, clinician, but someone who actually specializes in eating disorders. There's a very big difference. Mm. So generally the person I recommend is uh, an acquaintance of mine. His name is Jake Lenardon. Um, I think his Instagram is breaking binge eating or something like that. Uh, he's a fantastic resource and he also has other resources that he can point you to. So seeing someone uh, for professional help can be very, very important. Um, so I, I definitely would do that. I have dealt with um, people who have eating disorders. And I think one of the most difficult things is the buy-in, right? You kind of have to get them to buy in, but you also have to shift the focus of the goals in a lot of cases away from weight and onto things like performance, behavior, lifestyle, quality of life. It, it can't be as number driven because they're already so neurotic and so obsessive in most cases. 
Um, so getting them to be like, how do you feel? You know, and, and it's like, well, I actually feel stronger now. Okay, great. Let's try and get you even stronger. Let's set some athletic goals. You know, how high is your box jump? Um, how much can you squat? How many pull-ups can you do? Like setting athletic goals that have nothing to do with their body image is, is very important because now they're exercising and it's, here's a tricky thing too, because with anorexia and bulimia, people can use exercise as a form to actually feed into their, yeah. their condition, yeah. right? So, so again, it's kind of a fine line to walk, but I think that if you focus on performance and you, they're not doing like excessive amounts of cardio and all this other stuff to try and lose weight, um, I think that can be really beneficial because then they get a different level of enjoyment out of it. It changes their association with, uh, with, with their training and what training is all about. It's not just there to lose weight. Um, you can change their association with their own body, right? Like, Hey, you know what? I feel strong. I like having a strong body. What does a strong body look like? You know, it starts kind of opening up different dialogues and potentially different opportunities to communicate and, and help these individuals. Um, Every individual that I've worked with who has an eating disorder, I've always rec referred out and recommended that they see a clinician. Yep. Um, I am not qualified to, to treat anyone like that. And so I always will only work with someone um, who is also seeing professional help. And then I communicate with them uh, because again, that's out of my wheelhouse and, and it's just, I'm not comfortable potentially fucking someone's like psychology up or health up even worse. So, so that's something I 100% of the time will always refer out to. And I'd highly recommend other coaches do the same. Yeah. And I think that principle and that idea is, um, I, I hear from the best coaches that I talk to is that they're not trying to, they're not trying to solve everything. They, they recognize yeah. that they are fallible and that they don't need to be the guy or girl that knows everything. Mm hmm yeah, no, exactly. And it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of either. It's like, especially as you start specializing, you know, in your career, you're not going to be the right fit for everyone. It's like, mm. could I train a marathon runner? Of course I can. You know, I understand all of the research that's involved, but how much practical experience do I have? Well, not that much. So it would be a learning curve. I'd have to learn it. And it's like, cause I don't know necessarily how to program for all that stuff as as well as I do for strength athletes and other types of athletes. And so it's like, it doesn't matter, but just, I think people need to stay in their lane for sure. Mm. Like recognize that, you know, it's, it's okay. Like your ego, you could put aside, like you don't need to be the big dog in every sense and solve every problem. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about this really interesting concept that you call while we're oh, still on nutrition auto regulatory eating. Okay. And this term of auto regulation, adjusting and adapting to on the fly based on your environmental and internal conditions fluctuating, um, is a term a lot of coaches are familiar with, so, but some public may not be. Um, but then there's this term auto regulatory eating that I really like people may have heard of intuitive eating, but you, you kind of restructure and reframe that. Can you describe this eating pattern framework because when we talk about building the skill of engaging with food engaging with nutrition um i think a part of the answer is in this framework you have kind of coined and um described so can you talk about that and how people can achieve that yeah so the, the reason why i came up with auto regulatory eating not i mean i'm not sure if i'm the first person to say it i just i wrote it in the article and that's the only time i've heard of it so i I definitely won't take credit for it um, because I have no idea. Maybe someone's used it before. I have, I have no idea. Okay. Um, but essentially intuitive eating is eating based on your body's natural hunger cues. Now, the difference between intuitive eating and autoregulatory eating is intuitive eating is specifically was designed not to manage weight, right? Because it was, it was implemented through, through the Hayes program and they use it as a way of getting people to disassociate from some of those neurotic and, and unproductive habits where people do have eating disorders and things like that. So it was actually a way to distance themselves from dieting while still improving their, their relationship with food, right? So the goal with intuitive eating is not to lose weight. It's not to improve performance. It's not to do any, it's just to improve their relationship with food and improve their quality of life, right? 
So that's a tool. I think a lot of that is very beneficial, but because it's not supposed to be used for that necessarily for, for weight loss or any of that stuff, that's why I just say auto regulatory training. Essentially it's very, very similar. Um, you would kind of like go through different stages, right? And uh, I can't even remember what I wrote in the article. I think it was like the it initial up. stage was learning and then it's execution and then it's conscious, uh, conscious regulation and then unconscious regulation, I believe, right? Um, but essentially how it works is if you listen to your own hunger cues, for most people, that is a great way to get overweight because good foods taste great and your body's just going to want to eat more. And especially if you are already overweight, intuitive eating got you there. You know, that, that same concept of listening to hunger cues. So it's not quite just listening to hunger cues or your natural hunger cues. What it is is paying attention to the foods you're eating and understanding how that impacts your goals. So what I call autoregulatory eating is more from a performance and body composition standpoint. We do definitely have physical um, objectives in, in this approach to eating. So again, it's, it's one of those situations where you start off, you might not necessarily know a whole lot, but eventually you're just able to maintain your diet without tracking anything, without weighing food, without you know tracking macros or calories. You just can either lose weight, gain weight, maintain your body composition, improve your performance just because you know what to do and you've done it for so long. So again, that was kind of why I went through those stages where like that initial stage would be learning, which is one of the reasons why I recommend people track calories for at least three months, at least three months, because you'll learn so much from that. But I want to pause then, there because that is the gateway to get the freedom to be able to feel like, hey, I can do this. I can control my body weight. If I want to gain muscle mass, I know what I can do. If I want to lose fat, I know I have the tools. Like I understand how to do it without needing to obsess and record everything. And that's, I think that's such a powerful skill. So I just want to highlight that you can't get there without this first learning phase. Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. So I, I'd highly recommend it for most people. Um, again, barring individuals with psychological disorders and, and eating disorders, things like that. Um, and then the second stage would be execution because initially we're just trying to build awareness. Next, we're trying to say, okay, how can we manipulate these numbers to get a specific outcome? And then now you're executing it. Now you're getting the results from that. And then you do what's called conscious auto-regulation. So this is something that I like to implement um, higher degrees of freedom in what's called like a maintenance phase where you finish the diet. Now it's time to, to maintain your body weight for a couple of months. Now, generally speaking, if you have a diet, the maintenance phase is going to be about two thirds of the length of the diet. So if you've dieted for three months, you're going to take a two month maintenance phase. This is going to help for a lot of different reasons. One, um, it's going to help reverse some of the metabolic adaptations that occurred, um, like reductions in meat, um, increased efficiency of your metabolism, which for weight gain is actually, or weight loss is actually bad because if your metabolism is more efficient, it's actually using more of the energy and not just wasting it. So um, your propensity to gain weight is going to be higher. Uh, it's going to help decay a lot of the psychological fatigue that occurred during the diet, you know, having to abstain from certain foods. It's very psychologically taxing or can be very psychologically taxing. Um, and then the last thing is we want to establish a maintenance. We want to be able to make sure that you can remain weight stable. Now, sometimes I'll have people track their calories during their maintenance block, but sometimes, and again, this is just depending on where they're at, if they were to enter that um, conscious autoregulatory kind of level, if you want to call it that, that's where I would get them to just maintain their body weight without tracking anything. I want you to keep your body composition more or less the same, so we're going to take photos every two weeks, make sure you're looking the same. We're going to track your body weight the same every single day, just like we normally do. And we're going to take the, the average of that. And I want you to keep your body weight within two pounds of, of, the, of the termination of your diet. So if you terminate the diet, you're 200 pounds, I want you to stay either 198 or 202. Don't go any further than that. And then you just see how that goes, right, for, for the two months. And if you're starting to gain overweight, you eat a little bit less. And that's that kind of auto-regulatory, that conscious control that, that I was talking about. And then eventually what you do is you just don't need to weigh yourself. You don't need to do anything. But again, that's a very, very advanced level where it's very, very skilled. And I still don't even think you'd be able to do that if you're a professional bodybuilder. 
Like, I just don't, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't believe you'd be able to do that because it's just, that's to be a professional at that level, you have to be so detailed, but for pretty much everyone else, for very high level athletes who aren't specifically physique sport athletes, I think that that last level of like unconscious control or unconscious auto-regulation is, is very, very effective. Yeah. Well, well described. I hope that was, um, I hope that gives people some like operating system to which they can, they can go off and execute. Um, and another thing I wanted to touch on is, um, there's this idea when you talk about maintenance, when people talk about, all right, if I want to maintain my body weight, I have to consume or I'm expending exactly this number. They say a static number. And because that's what a lot of these apps give, um, actually Lane Norton's app actually does the opposite, which, which I like gives you a range. And then you really, you, you've talked about that maintenance caloric intake or and caloric intake in general, a surplus or a deficit, it's a fluctuating range. Can you give some context and description around why that is, how that is, and how people can think about that in their day to day? Yeah, and, and this is actually something that's really misunderstood. Um, so there's this concept energy balance, right? So energy balance is essentially the relationship between energy intake and energy output. So the food and, and the calories that I'm consuming through food, drinks, whatever, versus how much energy I'm expending through, you know, various metabolic functions, daily activity, sleeping, breathing, stuff like that. Um, and that relationship is not fixed. It's not like it's 2,600 calories, period. Because what if I go for a hike that day? Well, now my energy expenditure has gone up. So in order to maintain energy balance, my calories have to go up as well. So energy balance is a fluctuating thing. And just like you said in Lane's app, um, it, it ranges. So it is a range. Um, and the maintenance phase, actually, this is one thing I forgot to mention about the, the maintenance phase as well. It was implied, but I didn't say it specifically. When we are trying to you know, undo some of the metabolic adaptations that occur, one of the ways that we're doing that is by increasing the calories over time. Because let's say you start off hypothetically at 2,000 calories. At the end of your diet, you're at about 1,100 calories right? Well, what the fuck? Are we just going to keep dieting and keep removing calories from that? So you start like, you can't do that. So one of the things that you do in the maintenance is you actually build up their calorie intake again, while remaining weight stable. So we want to get them back up as high as we can. If it's higher than 2000, great. If it's real close to there, great. If it's 20 or sorry, 1800, great. But we want to make sure that we push the calories as high as possible before going into the next diet, because then we have way more room to work with. Whereas if you start at 1100 again, where are you going yeah. to go? You're going to eat 500 calories a day. It's like, it's not going to happen. So that's a really important part as well. And one of the ways you can augment that is through something called high flux. So high flux is kind of the description or flux, I guess, is a description um, of the relationship between energy intake and output and how that can be a bit more of a range. So one of the ways that you can adopt what's called a high flux approach is by increasing your energy expenditure, which allows you to eat more food while still remaining at a maintenance uh, level. Or if you want, um, you can be in a deficit, whatever, but it allows you to consume more calories without gaining weight is essentially what it is. So this is one of the reasons why in, in some cases I implement a step count for, for some of my athletes where I might say, I want you to hit this number of steps every single day. <clears throat> excuse me, because then that allows us to monitor their energy intake. I can look at where their body weight is trending. And if they're losing weight, I can be like, all right, cool. We're going to bump you up. And then we just keep pushing their calories, keep pushing their calories, keep pushing their calories as high as we can. Now you don't want to automatically add a ton of additional work uh, to your training, especially if you're already a competitive athlete, because that's just extra energy that could have been dedicated to either more training or recovery. So you need to be careful with this if you are a competitive athlete or if you're a high-level athlete of, of any kind. Um, but what you do want to do is you want to slowly increase the calories and monitor the weight. Once your weight starts adjusting and starts kind of creeping up, then it's like, okay, I need to add a little bit of exercise just to maintain. And so you keep increasing calories and then match it with energy expenditure. Increase calories, match it with activity. Increase calories, match it with activity. If, so you, want to, if you want to keep eating more food and maintain 
Yes, if minutes. you want to keep building up and building up and building up to, to adopt that kind of high flux approach to, okay. to, to dieting and to the maintenance phase. Um, and even if you don't, even if you just want to stay where you're at, I still think it's a good idea just to rebuild your metabolism again. There's no such thing as metabolic damage like, like a lot of people have, have talked about. What ends up happening is these are very, very normal adaptations that occur as a result to what essentially is controlled starvation. So they're completely normal. You don't have adrenal fatigue. You don't have any of these you know, major metabolic issues that a lot of people claim. It's just a normal part of dieting. And so you do want to help reverse some of those because a lot of these adaptations are highly sensitive to um, body weight as well as body fat percentage mm-hmm. and the stores of body fat. They have, they have, um, they have these receptors that, that tell your body, give your body feedback, hey, you know, we're losing too much body fat. You know, we're essentially starving. So what they do is they start creating these different biochemical changes in, in hormone release and things like that. So you have an uptick in ghrelin, which is kind of a hunger hormone. And leptin is, is also really, really uh, closely associated with kind of monitoring or sort of managing all of these different signaling patterns uh, or pathways. And so, <coughs> excuse me, when those change, it's going to be very hard to stick stick with it. So you want to help undo some of this, um, some of these adaptations by increasing your calories over time. So it's not just about eating more calories. It's also about making sure that you're at kind of a healthy range yeah. um, as well. Well said. I hope that gives some clarity. Um, where I want to kind of close out the tail end of this conversation is actually a little bit more about you, Daniel. Um, actually, I wanted to bring it up early, but it, it felt more natural uh, to let it go. But you talked about at the beginning, people having these big, huge goals sometimes they set for themselves and they're not aware of what it really is going to take to look or be like this, right? And so there needs to be an anchoring of perspective. But, you know, I read for you, like you have this long-term objective to squat a thousand pounds, bench 600 pounds, deadlift 900 pounds raw, okay? Mm -hmm. And you acknowledge that they're going to take a long time, they're ambitious, but they're attainable. And so when you look at such a lofty, but, you know, inspiring, energizing outcome and goal, how do you think about structuring the long-term plan around lofty goals that you set for yourself? How do you break it down into smaller chunks? What's your process? Um, honestly, once I set a goal, I never look at it again. Okay. Um, I, I, I know a lot of people are kind of conflicted when I tell them that because it's really popular to look at your goals every day and manifest them. Visualization and, all stuff, but, and yes. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know what? At the end of the day, I think whatever works is whatever works. Sure. But for me, what ends up happening is I look at these goals and they distract me from what I need to do now. You know, what because... You Well, I mean, my goals are predicated on what I do today. You know, thinking about my goals, visualizing about my goals, it's not going to do anything for for me, right? For other people, it might, but not not for me. So all I do is I think, what do I have to do right now? And then I just do that. So I'm checking little boxes every day. If I just check the box every single day, I know I'm good. So it's like, okay, what do I need to do? What's my checklist? You know, so uh, you do obviously have to kind of reverse engineer it. So it's like, okay, if I want to squat that much and, you know, do all those other things, what do I have to do? Well, first I need to weigh about 360 pounds. So, okay. I got to get up to 360 pounds. Can we, can we um, go into that? What, why'd you come up with that number? Um, so the range between 350 and 370 is roughly where I think I'll top out for a healthy body weight. Um, even that wouldn't be healthy because even if you are predominantly muscle, it's just so hard on your body to be that heavy. Yeah. Um, And I think that if I went too much past the 350, 360 mark, I don't know that it would benefit me as much as it would harm me, you know, because if you're more athletic, if your work capacity is higher, you can train harder, you can handle more volume, it's going to make you a better athlete. But if you're too big and you're too out of shape, it's going to, it's going to cause more harm than it does good. So, so I, you know, it's an assumption. It's not like a fact, but is that based off other professionals that you've seen? Like they based off myself. It's based off yourself. Where are you at right now? Uh, So I actually finished dieting a while ago. So I'm 260 right now. 
the heaviest I've been was uh, 290. Okay. So you've never and touched so, the, the 300s yet. This is kind of an assumption based off experience. Yeah. The heaviest I've been was three, two, 295. Okay. Right. Um, and at that body weight, I was like, I felt pretty good. Like I still felt very athletic. And so I was like, okay, if I slab another like 60 pounds on me, that'd be pretty solid. Um, so I think it's very reasonable for me. Now it's a long-term goal. It's going to happen over like five years, yeah. right? To get up to that body weight. But um, yeah, so I'll look at a goal like that and I'll be like, okay, what's the criteria that I probably need to have? So I need to be that body weight. I need to make sure that I'm sleeping about 12 hours a day. I need to make sure that I have the financial uh, resources to pay for, you know, physical therapist, for, um, you know, proper, proper coach, things like that, because I'm self-coached. Uh, kind of always have been actually. And so this year I'm actually going to be hiring a nutrition coach uh, to help me with some of my stuff. Just because once you get to a certain level, you just kind of start, there's too much anxiety around coaching yourself. You know what I mean? Like you just not <laughs> like you have a certain level of like detachment and objectivity when you're coaching an athlete, but then when it's yourself and you have a bad training session, all of a sudden the world's, the world's caving in around yeah. you. You know, so, so for me anyways, I just realized, okay, you know what, it's time to, to hire a coach. And I mean, I got re like, I wanted to get strong so I could show myself like, Hey, I know what I'm doing and I reached those targets. And so it's like, okay, I'm, I'm fine with hiring a nutrition coach. And then probably over the next little bit, probably hire a, a, a strength coach as well, but just kind of step-by-step. Step. So, but, but yeah, those, those are the kind of things that I need to do. I need to make sure that I'm working with a, a psychologist so I can work out some of like my own personal issues so that I can just have a better quality of life in general, better relationships. Because when I have better relationships, I feel more fulfilled. When I feel more fulfilled, I'm able to pursue my purpose, which is my training and my career more, and I'll just get better outcomes. So it's like all of these different things kind of need to align as well. Um, and then I just kind of break it down and say, okay, well, what do I need to get there? Well, the easiest thing is I need to make sure that, you know, I'm sleeping enough, eating enough. And so it's like, okay, check, check. I just do those every day. Um, the financial part is really simple as well. Once I have the finances to do this, awesome. I'm, I'm going to do that. Once it reaches a certain level, then I add on the next thing. Once it reaches the next level, mm. then I add on the next thing. And so that's kind of how I look at goals. And I, I try not to ever really visit my goals too much. Um, but I'll set little milestones along the way, like, um, like I want to squat 500 for 10 and I'm, I'm really close to that. Like I, I, I think I can either do it now or maybe for a month from now, I'll be able to do it. Um, so that, that was a big goal that I had for a while was, was the 500 for 10. And so, yeah. So like I'll set little goals like that for myself. Do you find that valuable? Long... Like to have like little markers that, okay. another like another checkbox to like, you're getting inching closer. Oh, it's so important. It's yeah. so fucking important. Because like realistically, like if you want to be one of the best in the world, not even if you just want to be one of the best, but if, if you want to be the best you can be, it doesn't matter where you are in comparison to everyone else, but if you want to be the best you can be, you're looking at 15, 20 years of dedication mm. for sure. Mm. And so if you're going to dedicate 15, 20 years, you better be getting some enjoyment out of the process or else you're just going to be like, man, this fucking sucks, you know? And and so I think those little wins are really important. Like those little, you know, kind of milestones that let you know, hey, wow, like I remember when everyone thought that a 500 pound squat was huge. Yeah. Now I'm doing that for 10. It's like, oh shit, like I've come a long way, you know? And, and then, you know, like I remember when I used to weigh 165 pounds. Now I'm 100 pounds heavier than that almost, you know? And it's like, oh, wow, okay, cool. It's, it kind of allows you to like acknowledge the, the hard work that you've done and sort of enjoy like, Hey, you know what? I am getting closer to my goals and it might take me another 10 years, but like I, I'll get there. I just have to be patient and consistent. That's it. You know? And, and so it's, it's really reassuring. You do need those wins. You, you have to have them in my opinion. There's something about that. I think, well, one is it's a perspective psychological reframe of like where you are now is once where you were wishing to be. Right. And then, you know, listening to, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Huberman, um, uh, neuroscientist is like these milestones, like when we create them and achieve them, they're very, uh, dopamogenic, dopamogenic. They're meaning like they trigger this reward pathway, um, of dopamine that makes us feel like we're on the right path, right? Mm -hmm. We are doing what we need to do. And it is, that's what he coins like 
dopamine having a role in triggering uh, the feeling that the human being is on the right path. And so they will continue doing it and the behavior will continue to cascade. Whereas if you, if Dan, if you didn't have that milestone and marker, then damn, that's such a long process before you get to that thousand pounds, 600 pound, 900 pound. And that can be, yeah. 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 And I mean, if you think about it too, right? Like how long are you actually spending competing in, in a powerlifting meet? It's like your combined time of, of in competition to hit that, uh, hit those numbers is going to be less than like seven minutes. It's going to be like five minutes. It's pretty crazy you know? so when it's you like, think okay. about it, right? Yeah. It's like 20 years of dedication for five minutes of an experience. But you that's know? the thing. Is it really about the the five minutes or is it about the 20 years? Well, and, and that's kind of the point, right? right. That, that's why I think you need to celebrate those things along the way. Give yourself a pat on the back and get right back to work. Um, you have to have those small wins. You have to have those little PRs and you have to be able to look for them in, in kind of uncommon places because, you know, maybe you don't hit a new PR, but you're like, oh, you know, my technique is way better than it used to be. Like you need to be able to just kind of find those positive reinforcers to tell you, hey, you know what? I'm doing the right thing. I'm getting better. I'm getting better and, and just kind of keep going with it. And, and that's not always easy, uh, especially like anyone who gets high level, you're destined to be injured. You will be injured. Like eventually I know I'll tear a quad or, or like I'll, I'll tear my bicep or a ladder or a pec or something like I know it's, it's bound to happen. Well, you say you I know have, it's bound to happen. Like yeah. what if you could, what if it doesn't? Like what if you could make it out? then I'd be an extreme anomaly. Are you trying to become an anomaly by doing everything possible? Or is it just you made peace with? with uh, well, I mean, I'm doing it because the thing is, if you're injured, you can't train. Mm. So you can't get better. So any serious athlete is going to really prioritize remaining injury free. But there's only so much you can do. You know, when you're lifting those kind of weights, okay, it just just fucking happens. You know, like I, I, I had two very serious back injuries. Uh, my last one was in 2018 and I had to wear a back brace and be on crutches for an entire year. Um, and so I lost a year's worth of training, but then I came back and I started training again and now I'm good. And, and, and so it's like, that was the one that really made me serious about, okay, like I really need to make sure I, I stay injury free. So there's a lot of things you can do. I think most injuries are avoidable, but some injuries, it's just like when you're, when you've got that kind of weight on your back, like when you're squatting 800 pounds, if anything goes wrong, you can die. You know what I mean? So, so if your knee caves in, the weight will crumple you to the ground immediately. And if your knee survives, it survives. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's just the way that it goes, right? Um, now, luckily in powerlifting, I have a lot of control over what happens. Whereas in football, someone might come and take out my knee or whatever, and then I'm injured. And, you know, there's a lot of more unknown variables there. So luckily I have a lot of, I have a lot of known variables and I can control my surroundings and environment and things like that. But again, when you're pushing your body to the limit and you're trying to break records and stuff like it's, and I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that I'm there, like I'm very far away from being there. Um, but anytime you're really pushing yourself past your limit, um, you do run the risk of being injured. Of course. You know, that, so yeah. it's kind of an, an inevitability. Like you just kind of have to accept it and just yeah. move on. Yeah. You're playing, not a think high, about it. you're playing a high risk game, but that that's, that's the role of the yeah. dice that you choose. Um, you, I got a couple of things off that. How many calories per day you, you hitting right now? Uh, everyone's always surprised because I actually oh, you have eat a very lot. little. Yeah. Yeah. I eat very little. Um, so on my recovery days, I eat about 2,500. And then on my training days, I have 2,700. Now, do you think that's, I don't think it would be. I think people would may think, are you having a recording error? Are you measuring it? But I don't, I definitely don't think that's the case no. for you. You just have like no. interesting metabolic response or energy. Yeah. Levels. I, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I guess I've just got like a really efficient metabolism. Um, Dude, that's okay, which, man, because you don't have to spend is, as much on food and you can feel, <laughs> like, you don't yeah. have to gorge 5,000 calories a day like some counterparts do. Yeah. Well, the benefit is it's easier for me to gain weight. 
yeah. right? So, um, but the drawback is it's also very easy for me to get fat. So I have uh -huh. to really be on top of my diet because the heavier you get, the harder it is to stay lean, yeah. obviously, right? So it, it's, I have to be very, very specific and very methodical about what I eat. Um, and this year actually might, I, this year has been the most success I've ever had with, with dieting. Um, it's, it's been pretty great. Actually, a lot of the, a lot of the habits, the routines, things have really, really kind of finally taken root and now are like pretty habituated. So well, what have you been doing? Like what's been really like, what's, that's what I wanted to ask you before. Like, what have you struggled with, with behavior change? And like, what are you doing now? That's really worked. <sighs> you know, the biggest thing is just, I think even people who are really, really good fall off the wagon every now and then. I think the biggest difference is they get back on so fast. They don't waste time, you know, I don't know, tripping about it, stressing about it, being like, oh, fuck, I fucked up my diet. It's just like, mm -hmm. they fuck up. Okay, cool. They jump right Very back fun. on. And so they're able to shorten the distance between or the time that it takes to, to actually get them on uh, back on track. And, and that stuff adds up because you know, a week here off your diet, a week there at the end of a year, you might've wasted like two months off your diet. You know what I mean? And, you know, like factor that in over five years, like that's, that's huge. You know, that's almost a full year of not dieting. And I think when you start looking at the extremes, right? Like, and again, it depends on what your goals are, but when you're looking at like the people who are the best, they're not separated by like 50 kilos. It's like, the difference between like first, second, and third place in powerlifting world championships is like five kilos mm. on their total. It's like it's so small a lot of the times. So you really need to try and capitalize on every little thing. But again, that's only something that you'd really need to focus on once you already have the fundamentals down. And uh, and so that's been the biggest thing for me is just being able to get back on track much faster, like right away, um, if I have a slip up. Do you have tools? Like, do you have like techniques in your mind that you tell yourself self-talk affirmations, um, cues in your environment that can get you back on the horse quicker? Um, not to it? get me back on the horse. I I'm really big on, on structuring your environment appropriately. So I'd much rather avoid than have, have a strategy to deal with it after. Ah, okay. so not to say that you shouldn't have a strategy, but, but I do my best. So I know that if I go with my friends, um, cause I'll usually only go out about once a week. And, uh, I know that if I go out with them, I'm probably going to eat a bunch of food, right? So what I'll do is I'll just make sure that I eat a shit ton at home. That's part of my diet. And so that when I go out with them, I'm just not hungry. So I might have something small, but it's not, if it does throw me off my diet, it's by like 200 calories. And it's only one day. It's, it's just like, it's not a big deal. And most of the time I'm fine. Right. So little things like that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's like I have all my meals prepped, you know, because if I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm feeling lazy or I'm like hungry right now, I'm not just going to go for what's easy. It's like I've got everything already done. I've, I've closed that gap between intention and behavior by, by you know, doing my meal prep beforehand um, and doing all this other stuff. So I think the environment is, is really, really an important piece. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you about sleep. 12 hours a night um, is not 10 to 12 is not necessarily uncommon amongst pro athletes. Um, but I think when people would hear that they might, they would freak out that you spend almost half your day sleeping. Is that actual sleep or time in bed? Do you record it? Like, can you break down why you've come to 12? Mm -hmm. Well, just to be clear, I definitely don't sleep 12. So I have sleep apnea and, and insomnia and a handful of other oh, disorders. Really? So, okay. so I actually sleep about five hours a night and that's okay. like a good night. Five or six would be a really good night. Um, so my sleep is actually horrendous. Uh, but the goal eventually is to uh, slowly build it up to, to 12 hours, right? And that would be in the form of naps and things like that. But... Um, but yeah, that's when training becomes very, very hard. And the yeah. bigger you get, you have more time to recover. And then your meals are really big, which make you lethargic and need to sleep more. So it's kind of like, it kind of comes in ebbs a little bit. But I noticed that when I had my most productive training, it was super hard, but I was training, I was sleeping about 10 hours a day. So sleep is super, super important. I just happen to be unfortunate that I have uh, a handful of issues that, make it very difficult for me to sleep but does, um 
Go on. I was just going to ask. I'm sorry. Um, does it excite you or energize you to think that once you can address those issues, because we know sleep deprivation and fragmented sleep, like we know very clearly the detriments that is on all body systems, particularly the nervous system, particularly strength, power, speed, all these biomotor qualities and the adaptations you make. Does it, like, oh, you think like, damn, once I hit this, once I fix this, address this, the, the, the ceiling of the potential will lift dramatically. Uh, I mean, I know that it will, but it's not something I really think about all that much. Um, it's not something you actively that bothers you that much. Like, no, you've been like, able to I, make so much progress in spite of it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. Um, because if I take a nap, so if I adopt like a biphasic approach to sleeping, right, I incorporate naps or something like that throughout the day, then I just don't sleep at night. Um, it, you know, so sometimes what I'll try and do is increase what you were saying earlier, time in bed. Um, that is a little bit more restful, but I also have PTSD and I'm, I'm very like sensitive to, to stress in general. Okay. Like I'm pretty chill for the most part, but at the same time, if someone sets me off. I don't have like a natural escalation. Like, you know, when you start getting into an argument with someone first, you start raising your voice a little bit and then you kind of, you know, maybe you start swearing and then eventually, you know, it gets to you guys fighting. It's like, for me, it's like, there's nothing or we're fighting. You know, there, there's, there's not really a whole lot of middle ground. Like my fight or flight response is so sensitive. So like, I can't even have any caffeine. Um, I'm going to be very, very careful. Even if I have like a little coffee in the morning, which like, you know, has very little caffeine in it. Um, I won't be able to sleep at night. So like, I'm really sensitive to stimulants. I'm really sensitive to stress in general. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why I have such a hard time sleeping in addition to some of the other issues as well. Uh, so for me, like my environment, my lifestyle has to be very, very like mellow, um, really carefree in order for me to get back to that 10 hours of sleep per night, um, which would kind of be like the optimal 10 to 12, if, yeah. if I can do that. Uh, but it's a pretty big undertaking because it's not like I have the time I could if I wanted to, but I just I physically can't sleep, you know, so that's tough, man. But you know what? It's yeah. also inspiring to see because you have become and done so much with what many would perceive as limitations, but you have been able to still transform yourself and become who you are and what you are in spite of the, the fracture and damage that may have occurred to you in your life. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, eventually, I don't think I've necessarily earned that title yet. But you know, over the next, let's say five years, hopefully, yeah, I can say something like that. Okay, well, there you go. I mean, that'll be a, I think it's, it's I think it doesn't end. But like, it's once you get to the, that place, at least where you can look at yourself in the mirror, it's very powerful. Um, at least, mm -hmm. at least so I hear, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I can't give that mm -hmm. to myself either. But it reminds me um, to finish off the conversation. One, if you don't mind me reading, just to give some context, something on your website uh, about your long-term vision of your company, Stack Strength, is funding the development of athletic programs, income youths. Having gone through my fair share of difficult times growing up, I think it's important for kids to have an outlet to keep them away from drugs and gangs. When all you see is violence, it's hard to believe in anything beyond gang culture. Sports provide kids with direction, keeps them grounded. It allows further development. Um to learn discipline and excel in something that's meaningful to them where they feel a sense of accomplishment. A lot of times, all they need is guidance and this gives them a chance to excel, be rewarded for their hard work and discipline. Now, I don't think people usually come to that type of vision without going through some serious hardship first, right? And I mean, you just mentioned uh, PTSD, you, you mentioned um, your, uh, your dramatic fight or flight response. And honestly, you can get into as much detail as you feel comfortable. But when you were younger, what do you remember about the toxicity of your environment that you, 
you will now want to help kids get out of? Um, yeah, so it's kind of a difficult subject to kind of navigate. Um, I was born into, let's just say like a, a pretty bad situation, um, with some pretty horrendous people and they did some not so great things to all the people who were there essentially. And, and, uh, <sighs> I, I think the biggest thing with that was I have, I have a really, really strong um, reaction to predators, mm. let's say, you know, people who are like manipulating other people, people trying to take advantage of other people. Um, and, you know, that's all like a part of gang culture and all that stuff where it's like, they bring you in, you know, you're like a family or all this stuff. And then it's like, I don't know. So Hmm. So I wasn't really prepared for this. This is a pretty like <laughs> a heavy hitter question. Um, Dude, that's totally fine, man. If, if you don't have to touch on it, if <clears throat> you don't feel comfortable, um, but you know, obviously raising, go ahead. Well, can, can, can you repeat the question? I sort of kind of got lost a little bit. <laughs> no, that's completely fine, man. You know, this is the pros and cons of giving people questions before a conversation and yeah. not because, man, this is your real response, right? Mm -hmm. People like, you're not alone. You've been through some shit, right? And people gonna see like, damn, like it obviously means a lot to him. Whereas if, if so you gave someone this question before, you know, who knows how much preparation, but to anyway, to ask the question again, I like understanding people's why, like what drives them like you that I can see that means a lot to you to help kids out of these impoverished environments. When you were younger, I wanted I was curious to know what you remember about the toxicity of your environment that sparked you. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so Mike Tyson was always like a huge uh, idol of mine, like huge, huge idol still is. And one of the one of the reasons why I think he's such a great role model for myself anyways, is because um, it was really inspiring to see someone come from that kind of a lifestyle and then just accomplish so much. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of the times when you do come from uh, a really impoverished lifestyle, if you do come from like a, um, you know, a lifestyle where like, you know, your, your family's in gangs or you're in a gang or something like that, there's a lot of shit that goes down. Right. And then kind of coming into sort of integrating into like normal society is so fucking different. Like it's so different how people respond to things like, and so seeing Mike Tyson go and, and like, I mean, he was a little gangster himself, you know, like he, he was carrying around guns when he was like 10 years old, robbing people, dealing drugs and shit, you know? And, uh, like his friends were getting shot and he was like, again, he was like 10, 12 years old. Right. And, and, uh, so to see someone go from something like that and then accomplish what he did, like, how did that happen? Mm. Well, he got introduced to boxing and someone was there, told him that he could be great and believed in him. And then he, he's one of the most iconic individuals in history. Like no matter where you go, everyone knows who Mike Tyson is, no matter where you fucking go on the planet. Like you could probably be in some you know, isolated <laughs> jungle region where they don't even have TV and they like speak their own weird foreign language and they'll still know who the fuck this guy is, you know? And so the kind of impact that he's had on other people because someone else like helped him out and believed in him, I, I think is like really inspiring. And then it also just goes to show that like, it doesn't matter how broken you are as an individual, like you can still accomplish some really great things. Like you look at him talk right now and like, you can tell he's fucked up. He's still fucked up, but it, I find that really inspiring, you know? And so I think the same thing with kids who, who were really, really poor, you know, who just had a really ghetto upbringing or who had a very difficult upbringing, you know, whatever it might've been. Um, I tend to think that, that makes you a lot stronger. And, and that's my opinion. You know, I, I think that terrible things happen to people and it's not fair and whatever, but life's not fair. And so I don't, I don't think you can really look at it from that lens. I think you have to just be like, you know what? I have gone through so much that it doesn't fucking matter what comes because everything that I've gone through, I'm still here. 
and I'm still moving forward and I'm still this. It just makes you like tough as fucking nails and really resilient. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think from my childhood anyways, like I'm, I'm pretty resilient and, and pretty tough in, in some respects, I guess. Um, and so I think, I don't know. I, I try not to be a dick essentially. Like I try, I try, I try and be like, okay, like step one. Yeah. Like I, I have the ability to do really bad things, but I try not to, you know, mm. I, I do my best not to. It, it's like, um, like I don't look very big right now, but it's like, whenever people see me, they're like, Oh fuck, you're huge. Like I'm 260 before I was 290. And like, I was an ex boxer and Muay Thai fighter. I'm a big, strong power lifter. It's like, all the things that I do are pretty much like a do not fuck with me sign, you know, especially even my tattoos and things like that, you know? And so it's like, I, I think that you have to have power before you can say that you're a good person, you know, like you have to have the ability to do bad before you can say that you're, I agree. you're actually good, you know, because if you can't, then, well, it wasn't your choice. You know, it wasn't your choice to do bad. It's like, if you can't get any women and you're faithful to your girlfriend, that's not because you're morally superior. That's because you don't have the option. Whereas a really attractive guy or a really suave guy who's very good with women, if he can get any woman he wants and he's you know faithful to his partner, that's a decision and that's morality. And so I think that like, you know, my experiences kind of rubbed off on me the way they did. And because of that, I think it's really important to kind of help other people out who who have maybe had some issues and, and maybe show a little bit more compassion to them. So it's funny because like, I'm not an empathetic guy. Like that's something that I definitely lack. But then when I see certain instances, I get super emotional. My friends will be like, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm just like, man, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that at all. You know? And so it's just like certain things that will kind of trigger you. And so I, that that's where I, that's where it kind of comes back to the whole, like, you know, Kids, kids who are poor, man, they're, they're really at risk. They're really at risk of getting involved in gangs. They're really at risk at like doing drugs, becoming addicts. And like, there's a whole host of different things. And it's like, it doesn't matter what fucking race they are, man. It's, it's a cultural issue. And so um, I think that's a huge thing. And then kids, you know, who are also impoverished, the likelihood that their parents have some sort of, you know, substance abuse issues or are abusive, like physically and, and things like that, or like sexual assault, like, all these things like they, they fuck kids up. And when you do that to a kid, you can't undo it. You know, like you grew up as an adult and like you look at the statistics on these things, they are very clear and they're damning and they're terrible, you know? And so I think it's really important to help kids out and give them a good footing for a future, you know, even if they weren't necessarily born into a good situation. So, totally. um, yeah. I don't mean to like step up on a soapbox or anything like that. Like, I, I don't know, but no, if you're going to step on a soapbox, this is one of them to step <laughs> up on, right? Like, this is like one of the ones like, and it means obviously authentically something very important to you. Um, what was the, I'm curious, what, what was the, 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 tr the, tr not the triggers in your, uh, that you say it's like that chokes you up. Cause you say you're not very empathetic. What gets your empathy? Is it? Yeah. <sighs> it's people who need help like people who need so like is it like a movie scene know. or a tv show scene or, or something you're like a, 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 something you've seen recently that you're like man that, that got me uh yeah man i'm a sucker for certain certain movie scenes so like um i was talking more so like real real life scenarios but i'm definitely a sucker so like when i was watching the mike tyson uh documentary yeah. and like that one that one hit me for sure um but I don't know. It's, it's more just like, uh, yeah, I have a hard time even describing it. Like, I guess I'll experience empathy in certain situations where people are like surprised, I guess. Like if I see, I don't know if I see someone who's all drugged out and like just a fucking junkie or something like that walking down the street, you know what I mean? Mm. Like certain things that just hit me a little bit differently. And I don't know, like, and, and that, that's just, you know, my own, my own experiences and like the people that I've known or whatever. But I, I think everyone's kind of the same way where they have things that are unique yeah. to their own life experience. And so it kind sure. of just, you know, is a little different, but. Yeah. Like, like the, like for me, it's like uh drugs, like I've seen like drugs and mental illness, like that's been in my family. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and yeah. when I see 
like I have quite of an aversion to it because of what I've seen. And so, you know, you kind of, you kind of want to run away from the, the pain and suffering and avoid the pain and suffering of what you've grown up with. But at some point, um, you are faced to interact and engage with it and, and face it to recognize why you feel that way. Um, but I think absolutely, man, everybody has, everybody's suffering from something we know nothing about, right? And that's the interesting thing, because that's the part that I don't give a shit about usually. <laughs> and I know that makes you sound like a bad person. I know it makes you sound like a bad person. But the thing is, like, you know, you know, like exactly what you said, where where it's like, give people the benefit of the doubt because you don't know what they've been through, right? You don't know their story. And for me, I'm like, fuck that. I don't give a shit what you've been through. Everyone goes through things that doesn't give you right to be a dick. If you're a dick to me, if you're a dick to someone I know, guess what? You're getting a fucking fist upside your head, you know? And I know it's not popular and probably no, makes no, me look like but, a brute or whatever. But, but you're saying like, where people that's... justify it for poor behavior. Don't justify it yeah, like, exactly. for shitty behavior. Yeah. But then at the same time, like I'll see I'll see a homeless person or I'll see like some fucking drug addict or I'll see some like some poor some like poor kid who's like shoes his holes in them. And I'm just like, Oh, you fucking like I don't know, man. It just it hits me, you know, it hits me different. Um, because like you said, yeah, there there's like I've known people who got strung out on drugs and they, they ended up committing suicide because it was like, and these were good people, like good people, good careers, like not weird, didn't have anything, you know, but then they went through like an extremely traumatic situation and they just completely broke down. They didn't get the appropriate help, unfortunately, and then they killed themselves, you know, and it's like, I know it's a little heavy, but it's like, that's, that's, that's real, nice. you know, and, yeah. and uh, that's not something that's unique to my life. That's something that everyone goes through. Like every single person, they have their own troubles. And it's like, you, it's really hard for me to sit here and be like, my situation is unique. It's like, I don't think that it is, you know, I well, think, I think everyone kind of goes through their own shit. You know? They do, but it's unique to you, right? Like, well, yeah, but your feelings. Um, sure. But at a global level, absolutely. It's like, yeah, that's the commonality that interconnects us all pain and suffering. Yeah, definitely one of them. <laughs> the the never ending perpetual suffering of yeah. life. And yeah. the crazy thing is, when you're young, a lot of it's involuntary. You didn't choose it. It just happens to you. And then when yeah. you grow up, well, Daniel, you've decided you have some lofty ass goals, right? And they require a lot of voluntary pain and suffering to get through them. Yep. This it's is a, true. It's a crazy dichotomy. Um who's your customato? Do you have one? Oh man, are you, are you looking um, for him? Or her? I, I don't know. I don't really have like. I don't have anyone specifically who I'm like. Oh, you're a role model to me. Um, I kind of have like a lot, but I don't have like one person who's like really special to me. You know? Do you, do you want to share some? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like uh, Tesla. Like, I really, I, I love like his books. I love his his story. Mike Tyson's a big one. Um, a lot of the other researchers who are like kind of involved in, in sports science, other athletes, like, um, I really like, like, uh, Mike Isretel. Yeah. He's, uh, he's really dope. Like he does a lot of really cool stuff for the industry. Greg Knuckles is really cool. Um, Eric Helms. Um, I don't know. And then just like, you know, athletes and different things like that. Right. But I guess these are people who I kind of look up to and I'm like, Oh wow. Like you're, you're super cool. Like you've done a lot for the industry. You've accomplished a lot. Like I really respect their, their acumen, their level of intelligence, their level of experience. Um, and so, you know, you kind of try and like meet that standard as best as you can, you know? Um, but they're so fucking smart that it's just like, you know, you're probably going to fall short, but at least you can do your best. Right. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, there, there's lots. I mean, I think most of the people who I really look up to, I, I don't actually even know. You know, it's like just in in books that I read and, and things like that. Um, that's most of it, to be honest. Okay. Well, I think this is a it's a good place to, to round out the conversation. Um, do you have, like, is there anything you're doing within the community of working with? Um, I know you have this vision for offering funding and development for programs, but is there anything that you'd want to promote um, any programs you want to bring light to, uh, anything you're doing or, or just things that you're seeing that you want to promote to, to finish off? 
At the moment, no. I was kind of doing, um, I was coaching people for, for free. Like I'd take a select number of people and I would coach them for free um, who were kind of like sort of struggling financially. I'm not doing that right now because I'm just way too busy with um, like some of the research that I'm doing and some of the articles. And like I, I was asked to, to edit um, a really big book that's coming out. Uh, so I'm doing like a collaboration on that a little bit. So I've just been crazy busy. So I haven't been doing, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, Renaissance periodization. Yes. Heard of that. So, you know, um, Dr. Mike, he's releasing, uh, the hypertrophy manual. Mm. And so, um, they reached out to me earlier this week and they asked me to, um, help them edit the, the book. And so I've been, awesome. I'm taking on that as well. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm, I've read some of it and I like it so far. Um, but yeah, just between that and all the other projects and like, I'm having to prep a couple of events I'm speaking at different conferences over the next little bit. It's just like been crazy busy. So I haven't had the chance to, to do anything. I've literally been working so much. So, you know, hopefully when things kind of smooth out a little bit, I'll have a little bit more time that I can kind of start putting a little bit more uh, attention and resources back into some of the things that I wanted to do as well yeah. like that. But that is the long-term vision and the more successful and financially yeah. stable you get, the better you can facilitate that, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but I kind of need to reach that sort of like critical mass before I can really start pushing any of that stuff the, the way that it, the way that it needs. Yeah. How do you say your last name, Daniel? DeBrock. Okay. I was going to say Daniel DeBrock. Thank you, my friend. Is there, is there anything you want to leave with any last parting comments, questions, ask of the audience, um, last parting thoughts or just where people can find you, where, you, where, where, where you'd point them? Uh, yeah. So I'm most active on Instagram. Um, I do have a Facebook, but honestly, it's just, it's so people are so negative on there. So I try not to really engage that much on Facebook, but, uh, I'm, uh, Daniel DeBrock on Facebook. I'm stack strength everywhere else. So stack strength.com stack strength on Instagram, um, stack strength on my Facebook thing, but I don't really use that. And then stack strength for my YouTube channel and then stack strength for my podcast. So Instagram is definitely going to be the best way to, to reach me. If you have questions, uh, send me a DM. I always get back to everyone. Um, so that, that'll definitely be the best way to reach me. Good man. And uh, I've never been to Calgary, but I love Canada. Well, I love Vancouver anyway. Um, but at some point, I'm sure I'll head back out there. You'll probably hear from me then, man. And if you're ever in for Melbourne, sure, uh, you need a place to lift. You let me know. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's, it's been fun. Yeah, man. I enjoyed the uh, the dynamic conversation that we had from science to personal, man. It was great. Thank you. For sure. All right. Take care. See you, Daniel. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. <laughs> we're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe. 